All right, welcome back to Mr. Burley Teaches, a series of lectures for the AP Environmental Science Classroom. It's now time to talk about waste and recycling. We have to look at how our society uses and disposes of our natural resources and its impact on the environment and on the natural systems that we depend on. This is one of my favorite units because it's so fascinating. It is something that's everywhere in our daily lives. The amount of waste that we produce, those unwanted byproducts, and what happens to them and the environmental impact. So let's take a look here and start the discussion with uh, a general idea of looking at waste in what's called inputs versus outputs. So let's start with some inputs here. Okay, when you're making any material product that's going to be used, there are a couple of inputs that go into the process. All right, there's two, and you might even be able to figure out what two those are. And what we're talking about is, and let's think about something as we move through here. Let's think about a plastic water bottle. All right, to make a plastic water bottle, you need two things. You need raw material. In the case of a plastic water bottle, that would be oil. So uh, any input would be uh, raw material or our natural resources. All right, and then we also need energy to go into the system to make any material product. So those are what we're going to call our inputs, the raw material used to make the product and the energy. All right, so when you make a product, you then use it. All right, and the time of use varies greatly. In the case of a water bottle, you might use it for 15 minutes. Um, in the case of some other example, you might use it over and over and over and over again, um, including those things that are recycled and re-recycled and recycled again. We use and use and use and use. All right, but at some point, the the material product becomes what we're going to call waste. All right, and there's a couple of outputs when it comes to waste. All right, first off is the waste itself, and that's what we think of as waste, the material part. All right, very loosely, anything that can be disposed of, uh, can be recycled, any unwanted byproduct. All right, and like inputs, after the use of a material product, there is waste energy. All right, so due to the second law of thermodynamics, energy is transformed from one form to another. Any energy that is no longer useful to us becomes waste energy. So this is a very generalized view of how to define waste from an ecological and a systems perspective, where you have a series of inputs, you then use that product, and then there's a series of outputs, which are what we call waste. So continuing this discussion, let's look at waste, all right, the material part, the unwanted byproduct. Okay, waste comes in many shapes and sizes, okay, any unwanted byproduct. It can be a solid, it can be a liquid, it can be a gas, all right, we have to remember that it could be anything, any type of waste. All right, and solid, you know, think about the trash that we produce as a society. Um, liquid, we can think about things like the sewage. All right, um, any toxic fluids, any toxic substances, fracking fluid that is no longer useful. All right, becomes liquid waste. Uh, gas, we can think about things like car emissions or emissions from a smokestack things like that. All right, so any unwanted byproduct is waste and must be disposed of. Now, if that waste is harmful, and what I mean by harmful, I'm talking about humans and wildlife. If it is harmful, that waste is called something different. It's called pollution. All right, so as a society, we ended up putting in too many outputs. Since the Industrial Revolution in the United States, we've become a throwaway society. We've become a society that produces a lot of waste, that has a lot of outputs. 
All right, and we started noticing some problems when we have that much waste. The first two problems were it started to pollute the air. The second problem was it began to pollute the water. All right, so we must reduce the amount of waste going into the air and the water. And what do you do when you need to reduce things? You create laws. All right, so early in the 1970s, the Clean Air Act. And then shortly after that was the, you'll never guess, the Clean Water Act. All right, these two laws became very powerful in reducing the amount of waste that went into the air and the water. So what happened as a result? The outputs and the waste that we were producing have now become a land problem. Okay, so now laws are starting to become passed that are help helping to protect the land. All right, so we continue to generate waste, but we move it from one location to another. So that's a nice little generalized viewpoint on how to start thinking about waste as we move forward here. Let's move on here and talk about what are the roots of our waste problem. Why have we become such a throwaway society? One of the problems is, is that we take our waste and we don't follow natural cycles like nature does. In nature, any waste is reused. There really is no waste. There's nothing that's considered waste. It's all reused. Uh, in our society, we really don't follow that rule. We generate things that we don't want anymore. So what are the roots of our waste problem? Uh, the first one is literally overpopulation. Why are we in this situation? It's because there's more people and we have to use more resources. Every time we create a product, it creates uh, an unwanted byproduct or waste. The more people, the more resources we used, we use the more waste it creates. Overconsumption. Uh, I, I believe in the United States especially that we use more than we have to. So overconsumption becomes a big problem. Packaging. We're talking about using material goods. We're talking about using raw materials just to transport other goods. In packaging, sometimes the total life of, of the packaging is just a few seconds. So we generate an enormous amount of waste, unwanted byproduct, just to transport the things that we're going to use. Wastefulness. This has just changed dramatically all right, in recent history. As countries and people become more affluent, they become a more and more disposable society. Non-biodegradability. We create products that don't break down in nature. And you're going to learn about some products and some ways that we actually do that. We actually prevent biodegradability to occur. We want these things to last. We want them to not biodegrade. Convenience. All right, we want. And those wants come with a cost. And the cost is waste, the generation of huge amounts of waste. And it, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of waste through convenience? All right, hopefully you thought about water bottles or a disposable coffee cup that's made out of styrofoam and it took oil and natural resources and energy to make that which was used for only a few seconds or moments. All right, convenience is a big root problem of our waste. And then we have limited resources which creates this dilemma. If there was an unlimited supply of natural resources on earth, if there was an unlimited supply of land and space to put our waste, we would not be having this discussion. All right, so it all comes down to the limited amount of resources that we have, which creates this dilemma. All right, and then there's another one that I don't have on this list, and I'm going to put it up here. If we've watched the story of stuff in class, you'll recognize another root problem of our waste is planned obsolescence. All right, planned obsolescence, that concept that we design products that are actually planned to become obsolete. And you all know this through uh, electronics, and we'll, we'll look at Moore's Law, or the concept that you know electronics go obsolete after only a few years in the materials economy. But this, this concept, this idea of planned obsolescence, spans so many other products. 
and materials, things like toaster ovens, um, you know, napkins and paper towels, uh, diapers, things that are, are supposed to be disposed of. Last one here, another thing that I don't have up here, a root of our waste problem, the miracle of trash. All right, the magic garbage fairy. All right, we all believe in the miracle of trash. We all believe that when we throw something away, it actually goes away. I mean, if you think about it, you produce these unwanted byproducts in your households and our businesses and industries. We produce these things in our garbage cans, and then we drag that garbage can down to the end of our driveway. So convenient. And then we go to sleep, and overnight, something magical happens. The magic garbage fairy comes and takes our waste away. Well, let me tell you, there is no away. Just like the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus, I hate to break it to you, the Magic Garbage Fairy does not exist. It goes someplace. And it's our job to learn and to become aware of what that means. Right? There is no miracle of trash. There's only the reality of the environmental impact of our waste problem. All right, so let's look at this a little bit further. Let's dive in and become better and more aware citizens. All right, let's talk a little bit in detail about waste. And I'm going to bring up MSW. This is something you need to know what this means. And what I'm referring to is municipal solid waste. OK? And what municipal solid waste is, is all the solid waste, we're talking about solid, what you and I would consider trash, uh, coming from residences and small commercial businesses. Okay, now, municipal solid waste, out of all the waste generated in the United States, only makes up about 2% of the total waste that's, that, that's generated by residences, commercial, and industry. Okay, now that's a very, very small number, 2%. The other 98% of the waste produced in the United States is falls under industry. Okay, but it's a little bit misconstrued because in industry, most of that industrial waste is taken care of. They'll figure out how much it costs to get rid of their waste, and it's actually more cost-effective to, to do recycling, to reduce the amount of emissions that they, put, that they give out. Um, so they're reducing their costs by taking care of their own waste, and, and industry is very good at that. Uh, an example would be uh, the number one waste-producing industry is agriculture. So agricultural waste, a lot of it gets recycled, a lot of it gets composted, a lot of it's used again. All right, so industry is very good at taking care of its own waste. So the, the municipal solid waste, of which it's only 2%, is where a, a big part of the waste problem in America lies. All right, and I'll give you a couple other numbers here. In the United States, uh, each one of us generates, on average, about 4.5 pounds of trash per day. Okay, how does that stack up to the rest of the world? I'll just give you a couple other examples. In Japan, another developed country, uh, an average citizen of Japan gives about or creates about 2.4 pounds of trash per day. If you take the entire developed world, on average, and this is the developed world, the industrialized world, we're looking at somewhere between 1.8 and our 4.5 pounds per day. In the developing world, we're looking at 1.2 pounds per day. So very big difference between the developed and the developing world, of which we by far uh, generate the most trash per pounds per day. Just kind of give you some numbers to this. The residences, you and I contribute about 60% of that 2%, whereas commercial businesses and smaller businesses generate about 40%. So even though we're talking about a small amount of the total trash, being 2% of municipal solid waste, of the entire waste produced in the United States on a yearly basis, 
um, we generate most of it. Okay, so what happens to all this waste? All right, there's really three things that can, can happen. It could be disposed of in a landfill, it could be incinerated at a waste of energy facility, or it can be recycled. So let's take a look at some of the categories of municipal solid waste. Let's take a look at the categories of municipal solid waste and the relative amounts, which do change year by year. But this is a good chart that I found from 2010 of the total municipal solid waste generation by material uh, for the year. All right, and this is before recycling. So take a look here because you might find some things that are interesting. The number one category of municipal solid waste is paper and cardboard. All right, followed very closely by number two, food scraps, and three, yard trimmings. All right, follow that up by plastics, and then you have metal, rubber, leather and textiles, wood, glass, and another category. All right, but take a closer look here and you might see something interesting. Look at all the parts that are organic and recyclable. So take a look here. Paper and cardboard is organic. Food scraps are organic. Yard trimmings can be composted. Wood is organic and can be composted. And then if you look here, plastics can be recycled. Metals are recyclable. All right, even some textiles is re are recyclable. Glass is recyclable. On average, 75 to 80 percent of all municipal solid waste is recyclable. Oops. Is able to be recycled. What percent do you think is recycled on average? It's about 33 percent. All right, so we have a little bit of work to do where 75 to 80% of the materials we dispose of, these unwanted byproducts are easily recyclable. Only about one third is recycled. All right, about 15% of this waste is incinerated. All right, at waste to energy plants and the rest goes to landfills. Okay. Where does all this trash come from? Most of our trash, the number one component of our waste, is in the form of containers and packaging. All right, things that we could probably reduce the amount of right now today if we made some personal choices and personal decisions to do so. Okay? So, that's a little bit about municipal solid waste by material right, before recycling. So now you know, now you're a little bit more aware of what these things are, what our waste is, and the components and the relative percentages. Okay, so we have a problem about how to dispose or take care of all this municipal solid waste. The most popular method in the past was open dumps. Uh, very unregulated places uh, which are now outlawed in the United States but it still happens in other countries like uh, tropical countries and the developing world. Uh, here's a picture of uh, an open unregulated dump in India. These, This is the number one way in other countries that waste is disposed of. There's a tremendous environmental impact. Before the 1960s, this was the common way to dump your trash. Um, it still happens today. This is an unregulated dump site just outside of Souderton. Uh, actually, it's down an old dirt road in Telford. The, this method of getting rid of waste was popular basically because it was free. Things that are hard to get rid of, people have this option to literally dump for free. These open dumps, however, are coming back to haunt us. A lot of times they were dumped near water sources and the stuff can get into the waterways, then it washes down to the bottoms of the rivers and it can literally get into the ocean. Okay, so the ocean became this dumping ground and it's starting to have a huge impact on the ecosystem and the fish and wildlife that lives in, in our oceans. So. This is a nice chance to bring up a very unusual feature on our planet 
called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And this is a, a very new, newly studied feature on the Earth. And what we're seeing is because of ocean current currents, all right, what we're going to call gyres. All right, if you look here at this picture, there's the Pacific gyre, the Pacific Ocean Current, that's off the coast of the United States, and it goes out towards Japan, and it circles back, and you have this big, giant, literally a conveyor belt of ocean current. Now, because that Pacific gyre is situated like a spiral, uh, any trash that gets into the creeks and streams will wash out into the to the ocean, and they'll literally get themselves into the gyre and accumulate in the center of that gyre. So if you have a whirlpool, things are going to naturally accumulate in the middle. We actually see two uh, concentrations of trash, of mostly plastics. One is off the coast of Japan, and one is off the coast of the United States, in between the United States and Hawaii. Uh, just north of Hawaii, but giant regions of of trash that's been accumulated for decades out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and it's starting to have a very big impact. There's only a few people that are doing research, but they're coming up with with staggering facts on on this this problem. What we're seeing is plastic material and debris uh, that's washing up on our beaches in delicate ecosystems. Uh, this happens to be a beach that's uninhabited by people, yet we see a lot of our trash and debris washing up on the, on these beaches. So it's having an impact there. Um, it's having an impact, obviously, on aquatic wildlife. I like this picture because you see a certain type of relationship here between the little fish and the turtle. And if you remember your biodiversity unit, you can name that relationship. However, this turtle is suffering from uh, our waste problem in that the plastic bag has attached itself on its body. All right, and there we have another impact on wildlife because of the trash. And this one stands out to me because what it shows you is much of this trash, in the previous pictures were large pieces of debris, but the problem of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch isn't usually large pieces of uh, waste debris. More so, the garbage patch, and if you think about a plastic water bottle that washes into a creek or stream, gets into the ocean, and it is then exposed to sunlight and UV radiation uh, for however long it's out there, those plastics are, and chemicals and petrochemicals are going to break down. And what we see is in the top left here. Now this, this scientist, what he does is he dredges a couple of miles He'll take a, a small thin net and dredge the ocean water in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And in the jar there, he's showing you what he, he, what he gets out of the trawling net. And what he gets is this plastic soup of small, tiny, broken down pieces of plastic and this soup of just chemicals. And what that does is it gets itself into the food chain. All right, so our waste, which is getting into the ocean, is now being entered into the food chain. And you know a little bit about biomagnification as those uh, chemicals and toxins bioaccumulate within an organism and then biomagnify up the food chain you know there, there could be an impact on human health all right so we're seeing this not giant water bottles and, and huge debris floating all over the place but instead we see this chemical soup of what our oceans are becoming and in the bottom right here you see this fish was dissected and it found over 16 pieces of plastic inside this one fish so we're seeing an impact in not only the ecosystem but in the wildlife which may be getting into the food chain all right, and can later impact human health so hopefully you're getting a sense of this problem that we're seeing here with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and it isn't limited to the to the Pacific Ocean uh, we're seeing this in all the oceans the Pacific is just the one that's been most studied even though it hasn't been studied much at all All right, and, uh, and I'll, something to leave you with last with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch uh, here's a picture of a bird who has many pieces of plastic in its, in its uh, innards and it died basically because of starvation. So this bird would see a bottle cap floating in the ocean and think it's food, and then go ahead and eat that bottle cap. And here you see a lighter, uh, at least three bottle caps, among other pieces of plastic that it mistook 
thinking it was food. So either it goes home to, and regurgitates these things for its chicks, or some of these pieces of plastic can get lodged in its intestines, and then the bird you know, will have a hard time digesting food and actually starve to death. So we're seeing a tremendous impact on wildlife. Okay, so what do we do? What do we do about all this? The impact is bad. We know that. All right. What do we do? In 1990, the, the EPA came up with the Pollution Prevention Act. All right, and what it did was it laid out a series of strategies that we should do to kind of minimize our impact with waste. So I put it in this triangle. And what I'm going to show you here is what's most preferred is on top, according to the EPA and the least preferred will be on the bottom. So the most preferred thing to do when it comes to waste on a domestic scale is to reduce. All right, and that we can do today. So let's continue with our water bottle example. You can decide today to stop using one-use plastic water bottles and you can get yourself a reusable water bottle which would save how many hundreds if not thousands of water bottles uh, in, in landfills. Right, it would save a tremendous amount of waste just switching to reusable water bottles. So you can reduce the amount of waste today. There's things that you can do. All right. The second thing that would be most preferred would be to recycle. And we're going to throw reuse in there with recycle because they go hand in hand. Reusing something is actually a little bit better than recycling. But for right now, we'll put those together. All right. That would be the second most preferred action that the EPA suggests. The third action would be to treat the waste. Right, and usually that's in the form of incineration to get the energy back. We call that waste to energy. And then the last least preferred option would be to dispose of it. And the disposal is in landfills. So this triangle shows you what the through the Pol Pollution Prevention Act of 1990 what the EPA is suggesting that residents and citizens can do to help reduce environmental impact of waste. And the reason why I have this hierarchy in the shape of a triangle is because unfortunately reducing, which is the most preferred action requested by the EPA, reducing the amount of waste we produce is actually the least done. Okay, Most of us dispose of our waste. All right. Like I said before earlier in this lecture, it's about 33% of our materials are recycled. So reducing, reusing, and recycling is done the least, but disposal is actually done the most. So it's something that we need to work on as laid out by the Pollution Prevention Act of 1990 and the EPA pollution hierarchy. So to conclude here, uh, it, it just seems like we need a plan. We need to know where we're going and what we're going to do with all this waste and how to handle it. And to figure out a way to address our needs while balancing the needs of nature and without sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So hopefully after watching this lecture and thinking about waste, you're a little bit more prepared to dive a little bit more in detail of this unit and to talk about waste and kind of realize the problem and hopefully at the end of this unit you'd even be willing to make a change. Thanks and see you next lecture.